Let me start off with an illustration that will be more in your field and then move you into mine, those of you in the medical profession. You're familiar with one of the theories of cancer that is popularly known as the scanner theory. And the scanner theory basically offers this proposal for why cancer ultimately overtakes a body. It is not necessarily an accepted theory, but it is certainly one that is studied and being proposed. That normal healthy cells within the human body routinely can become cancerous. But because the body has within it a yet unknown built-in mechanism that is able to warn the body of the cancer in some of these healthy cells, seek out those cancerous cells and destroy those cells before they have the possibility of replication to the point of a tumor and overtaking the whole body. What is being proposed by this theory is that in that system, it is not so much the cancer that ultimately destroys the individual as much as it is the failure of the scanner theory to be able to detect it in its early stages when healthy cells have been thus infected. May I suggest to you that whether that theory is true to reality or not, it suddenly offers us an analogy for the ethical predicament in which we find ourselves. And may I suggest to you, it is the inability to detect the ethical dilemmas long before they get into the situations you face that really is causing our nation at this point to be in a state where we are being overcome completely by moral confusion. So I have entitled my talk in one of two ways, changing times, shifting foundations, and diametrical choices, or to give it a more provocative title, unplugging truth in a morally suicidal culture. Let me present to you first the two mindsets into which you and I as Christians are invited today to take this mindset as ours. I present to you first an article from Peggy Noonan, the speechwriter and journalist who contributed this article in Forbes magazine, September 14, 1992 issue. It was the 75th anniversary of Forbes, and the editors of Forbes wrote to about eight or 10 or 11 great scholars and social analysts of our time to answer this question. Please take note, why are we as a people so unhappy in these modern times? Many of them were Nobel laureates, and Peggy Noonan was one of those contributing writers, and I think possibly was the most perceptive of them all. Listen to how enveloped in that grand article that she wrote is this particular concept. She says this, we have all had a moment when all of a sudden we looked around and thought that the world is changing. I am seeing it change. This is for me the moment when the new America began. I was at a graduation ceremony at a public high school in New Jersey. It was 1971 or 1972. One by one, a stream of black-robed students walked across the stage and received their diplomas. And a pretty young girl with red hair, big under her graduation gown, walked up to receive hers. The auditorium stood and applauded. I looked at my sister and said, she's going to have a baby. The girl was eight months pregnant and had the courage to go through with her pregnancy and take her finals and finish school despite society's disapproval. But society wasn't disapproving. It was actually applauding. Applause is a right and generous response for a girl with grit and heart. And yet in the sound of that applause, I heard a wall falling. A thousand-year-old wall was falling, a wall of sanctions that said, we as a society do not approve of teenaged unwed motherhood because it is not good for the child, not good for the mother, and not good for us. The old America had a delicate sense of the difference between the general, we disapprove, and the particular, let's go help her. We had the moral confidence to sustain the distance between official disapproval and unofficial sucker. The old America would not have applauded the girl in the graduation gown, but some of its individuals would have helped her, not only materially, but with some measure of emotional support. 
We don't do much of that anymore. For all of our tolerance and talk, we don't show much love to what used to be called girls in trouble. As we have gotten more open-minded, we have become more closed-hearted. My message to society is this, says Peggy Noonan, what you applaud, you encourage, but beware of what you celebrate. What you applaud, you encourage, but beware of what you celebrate. The most terrifying aspects of the foundational shifts in our time is not just that the line between right and wrong has all of a sudden been made unclear. Not just that morality has somehow had its boundaries altered. What has dramatically happened in your time and mine is for those of us from a religious perspective or a theistic worldview or the Judeo-Christian worldview, we are not only being asked to erase those lines and move the fences, it is now being demanded of us that we join the celebratory cry, a triumphalist cry of those who have somehow shaken off these restrictions that religion had imposed upon them for centuries. So lifestyles that were once at best aberrant or undesirable by Christian standards, we are now told not merely to accept, which is one thing, but we are now told to celebrate those very issues. And that is what is happening in the very arena of medical ethics too. The emotion and the outrage that comes out when you and I may respond from a Christian perspective, they are not content, some voices at least, to merely bring us to accept that view, it is demanded of us now that we celebrate that view with those of opposite perspectives. That is the first mindset that is somehow being superimposed within the framework of the Christian life. But there is a second one, and this is very, very subtle. And again, voices long before ours had alerted us to this, but we were not as receptive or certainly missed the urgency with which they were cautioning us. I talked of the book, The Abolition of Man, written by C.S. Lewis, one of his less popular ones, although I think one of his most powerful ones. Lewis, as you know, does not normally, did not normally respond to his critics. Very rarely did he even defend himself. But now he had picked up a book that he wanted to respond to. He called it by a different name so that he would not be on a frontal attack of these writers. He said the book actually exists. I shall call it the Green Book. It is written by two authors whom I shall rename Gaius and Titius. Lewis says, but be sure these authors exist and the book exists. These authors were trying to teach children how to think about ethical choices. And one of the illustrations Gaius and Titius give in their book that teaches children on this subject is to go back to Samuel Taylor Coleridge's illustration where two young boys are standing in front of a waterfall. And one of them looks at the waterfall and says how pretty it is, how beautiful it is. But the second boy just gazing at it with a sense of awe within him reflecting on the grandeur of how God had made this wonderful universe. He looks at the waterfall, this other young boy, and he says, this waterfall is sublime. There is such a sense of awe that it invokes within me as I stand back and see how marvelous such a piece of creation is. Gaius and Titius go to great lengths to point out that the young lad who described the waterfall as sublime was wrong-headed. The boy who described it as pretty and beautiful was correct. They go on to point out why. The reason being this, there is no such thing as sublimity out there. There is no such thing as sacredness out there. There is no such thing as an absolute that ought to invoke an awe within us out there. This boy had to be retrained for his training had taken him in a wrong-headed direction, the feelings engendered within him that prompted him to say this waterfall is sublime were purely a construct. Those feelings were glandular, generated some sense of appreciation, which he ought to have described as pretty and beautiful, not as something sublime, not as something awe-inspiring, not as something the work of a transcendent being. 
Lewis latched on to this. He said, we are in the dangerous first steps here because what Gaius and Titius are trying to point out to us, says C.S. Lewis, is that absolutes, things such as right and wrong, do not exist in an objective point of reference. They are purely constructs of our culture. And within those constructs, those feelings are brought about to describe something that is not out there, but merely in here. C.S. Lewis says the frightful thing about Gaius and Titius is that they are telling me mathematics is real, therefore my brain is real. Food is real, therefore my stomach is real. But the absolute moral order is not real out there. It is purely within here. Lewis says if I take these men in their arguments, they will produce a generation of men with brains, men with stomachs, men with no heart, men without chests. No proper emotional response that is in keeping with the reality of what is going on out there. But you see, the judge could not keep a juror in her chair at the O.J. Simpson trial because when the spectacle of a bloody, mangled body was shown, the juror stormed out of there. That juror was a person with a chest, with a heart, with emotions that were reading reality, not a construct created by upbringing. Isn't it fascinating in your time and mine that the radical, liberal view on these things can invoke any kind of unbridled emotion, do any kind of thing in public, but when the person stands up to defend the cause of God in issues such as this, and the emotion arises within the human heart, we are asked to suppress that emotion. We are asked to become people without chests, just brains and stomachs, no heart, no emotion that registers reality out there. Those are the two mindsets from which I address to you how all of this came about. Not merely eroding the lines, not merely pushing back the fences, but also wanting us to come to a point of celebration of a conflicting worldview. And what is more than that, I am asked to keep my emotions only to myself, that I'm no longer allowed to respond to the tragedy of the slaughter of the innocence that is going on by the millions. Somehow, I am to be made a man without chest while such things are being carried on under the illusion of progress. That's where we begin. That is the mindset. But you see, we were warned about this, weren't we? Many writers saw it 30, 40 years ago. 30 years ago, the voice of Archibald MacLeish writing in the Saturday Review, October 14, 1967. Listen to what he says. There is in truth a terror in the world, and the arts have heard it as they always do, under the hum of the miraculous machines and the ceaseless publications of the brilliant physicists. A silence waits and listens and is heard. It is the silence of apprehension. We do not trust our time, and the reason we do not trust our time is because it is we who have made the time and we do not trust ourselves. We have played the hero's part, mastered the monsters, accomplished the labors, and become gods. And we do not trust ourselves as gods because deep inside we know what we really are. In the old days when the gods were someone else, the knowledge of what we were did not frighten us. There were furies to pursue the Hitlers and Athenas to restore the truth. But now that we are gods ourselves, we bear the knowledge for ourselves like that old Greek hero who learned when all the labors had been accomplished that it was he himself who had killed his sons. Muggeridge, MacLeish, listen to Chesterton because you'll identify with it best. You are free in our time to say that God does not exist. You are free to say that he exists and is evil. You are free to say like poor old Renan that God would like to exist if he could. You may talk of God as a mystification or metaphor. You may boil him down with gallons of long words or boil him down to the rags of metaphysics. And it is not merely that nobody punishes, but nobody protests. But if you speak of God as a thing like a tiger, as a reason for changing one's conduct, then the modern world will stop you somehow if it can. We are long past talking about whether an unbeliever should be punished for being irreverent. It is now thought irreverent to be a believer. 
These were in the last 30 to 50 years, alerting us to the path we have entered into. That's why I so commend an institution such as this, realizing what the entailments can be. Our choices are only going to become more and more difficult, and the defense of your belief based on your belief in God is going to be harder to sustain. How did this happen? How did this come about? Let me present to you three mindsets that set the stage for where we are today and contrast them with what God has to offer in its place. Number one is the mindset of secularization, the mood of secularization. Let me define it as Oz Guinness, and who borrows from Peter Berger and gives this rather uh, good composite of what the process of secularization is all about. Secularization is a process as Guinness where religious ideas, institutions, and interpretations have lost their social significance. Let me repeat that. Where religious ideas, institutions, and interpretations have lost their social significance. In other words, even if you must claim to be a religious person in a secularized society, that is all right, so long as you don't bring those ideas about in our social institutions and in public debate. Keep those ideas private. So secularization is where religious ideas, institutions, and interpretations have lost their social significance because God is an encumbrance. After all, it was the same Huxley in the same book in 1946 who said this, I want this world not to have meaning. How do you like that? I want this world not to have meaning. Because a meaningless world frees me to my own erotic and my own political pursuits. There's as upfront a skeptic as you would want to hear. Meaningfulness was an imposition upon his freedom. Meaninglessness was a liberation. And that's why even Stephen Jay Gould, uh, the paleontologist from Harvard University, goes on to say, once you find out that there is no superior wisdom, no superior cause, it is liberating, if not exhilarating. Secularized consciousness. Now, here is the agenda behind this definition that if religious ideas, institutions, and interpretations have lost their social significance, then how do we ever debate publicly affecting issues when the ethic is meant to be kept in private? Toronto, Canada. For nearly 100 years, Toronto was called Toronto the Good. It was called Toronto the Good because the mayor of the city of Toronto in the 1880s, who also happened to be the first president of the Christian and Missionary Alliance in Canada, William Howland ran for his mayoralty office on a platform of cleaning up the city's immoral streets. He made his point very clear that the city was going to rot with the loss of its moral fiber and he was going to do something to change it. He won a resounding victory. And even though at the time of re-election, even his opponent in a, in a kind of a crafty way rented all of the public transportation for the day of the voting, people walked mile upon mile upon mile to put William Howland back in office, and they did that. After his office, the city for nearly 100 years has been called Toronto the Good. In the 1980s, a major moral issue faced the people in the city of Toronto, and the man running for office at that point was asked to deal with it. Interestingly, on the moral issue that was confronting him, tens of thousands of people telephoned him and told him not to go along with that special interest group's agenda, whatever it was, and pled with him and asked that Toronto be kept in the image that it has sought for so long, keep it as Toronto the good. Do you know what the candidate said and won the office? Do you know what he said? Although I got thousands of calls from people against this particular platform, I am going to hold on to it because most of them calling were religious people who had prejudices on moral issues. He discounted their opinion purely on the fact that they were religiously minded, not whether it was right or wrong, but it was anchored in some creator being. When religious ideas, institutions, and interpretations have lost their social significance and man becomes the pure measure of all things, shame as a real response is being removed. 
That's why psychological theorists today are addressing this whole issue of shame and guilt again, trying to put it in the context of the modern mindset, which has jettisoned absolutes, but is unable to expel the sense of shame and guilt within. That's a prime effect. And when you're dealing with issues of ethics in the medical profession, remember, one of the things that the secularized consciousness has done is try to eradicate the sense of shame. If secularization has allowed its logical outworking, it makes life unlivable because it eradicates that legitimate sense of shame that God has put into your heart and mind. I present to you first an article from Peggy Noonan, the speechwriter and journalist who contributed this article in Forbes magazine, September 14th, 1992 issue. Listen to how enveloped in that grand article that she wrote is this particular concept. She says this, we have all had a moment when all of a sudden we looked around and thought that the world is changing. I am seeing it change. This is for me the moment when the new America began. I was at a graduation ceremony at a public high school in New Jersey. It was 1971 or 1972. One by one, a stream of black-robed students walked across the stage and received their diplomas. And a pretty young girl with red hair, big under her graduation gown, walked up to receive hers. The auditorium stood and applauded. I looked at my sister and said, she's going to have a baby. The girl was eight months pregnant and had the courage to go through with her pregnancy and take her finals and finish school despite society's disapproval. But society wasn't disapproving. It was actually applauding. Applause is a right and generous response for a girl with grit and heart. And yet in the sound of that applause, I heard a wall falling. A thousand-year-old wall was falling. A wall of sanctions that said, we as a society do not approve of teenaged unwed motherhood because it is not good for the child, not good for the mother, and not good for us. The old America had a delicate sense of the difference between the general, we disapprove, and the particular, let's go help her. We had the moral confidence to sustain the distance between official disapproval and unofficial succor. The old America would not have applauded the girl in the graduation gown, but some of its individuals would have helped her, not only materially, but with some measure of emotional support. We don't do much of that anymore. For all of our tolerance and talk, we don't show much love to what used to be called girls in trouble. As we have gotten more open-minded, we have become more closed-hearted. My message to society is this, says Peggy Noonan, what you applaud, you encourage, but beware of what you celebrate. What you applaud, you encourage, but beware of what you celebrate. The most terrifying aspects of the foundational shifts in our time is not just that the line between right and wrong has all of a sudden been made unclear. Not just that morality has somehow had its boundaries altered. What has dramatically happened in your time and mine is for those of us from a religious perspective or a theistic worldview or the Judeo-Christian worldview, we are not only being asked to erase those lines and move the fences, it is now being demanded of us that we join the celebratory cry, a triumphalist cry of those who have somehow shaken off these restrictions that religion had imposed upon them for centuries. So lifestyles that were once at best aberrant or undesirable by Christian standards, we are now told not merely to accept, which is one thing, but we are now told to celebrate those very issues. And the defense of your belief based on your belief in God is going to be harder to sustain. How did this happen? How did this come about? Let me present to you three mindsets that set the stage for where we are today and contrast them with what God has to offer in its place. Number one is the mindset of secularization, the mood of secularization. 
Let me define it as Oz Guinness, and who borrows from Peter Berger, and gives this rather uh, good composite of what the process of secularization is all about. Secularization is a process, as Guinness, where religious ideas, institutions, and interpretations have lost their social significance. Let me repeat that. Where religious ideas, institutions, and interpretations have lost their social significance. In other words, even if you must claim to be a religious person in a secularized society, that is all right so long as you don't bring those ideas about in our social institutions and in public debate. Keep those ideas private. So secularization is where religious ideas, institutions, and interpretations have lost their social significance. One person writing in a jocular vein puts it in this way what secularism is all about. First, dentistry was painless, then bicycles were chainless, and carriages were horseless, and many laws enforceless. Next, cookery was fireless, telegraphy was wireless, cigars were nicotineless, and coffee caffeineless. Soon oranges were seedless, the putting green was weedless, the college boy was hatless, the proper diet fatless. New motor roads are dustless, the latest steel is rustless, our tennis courts are sodless, our new religion godless. That is the secularized mind where religious ideas, institutions, and interpretations have lost their social significance because God is an encumbrance. After all, it was the same Huxley in the same book in 1946 who said this, I want this world not to have meaning. How do you like that? I want this world not to have meaning because a meaningless world frees me to my own erotic and my own political pursuits. There's as upfront a skeptic as you would want to hear. Meaningfulness was an imposition upon his freedom. Meaninglessness was a liberation. And that's why even Stephen Jay Gould, uh, the paleontologist from Harvard University, goes on to say, once you find out that there is no superior wisdom, no superior cause, it is liberating, if not exhilarating. Secularized consciousness. Now, here is the agenda behind this definition. That if religious ideas, institutions, and interpretations have lost their social significance, then how do we ever debate publicly affecting issues when the ethic is meant to be kept in private? When Larry Flint, the pornographic entrepreneur, was being tried in the city of Atlanta, a very fascinating method emerged in the lawyer defending him. Larry Flint was being tried on several counts of pornography where some witnesses said his pornographic material was so bad it even made Playboy look quite acceptable. And in all of these counts that were brought against him, the lawyer defending him took this tack while he was testing potential members of the jury. One of the questions he would ask them was, are you a member of a church? And in the South, the answer is in the affirmative for more of them than for not. Are you a member of a local church? If the answer was yes, they did not qualify to be on the jury because they would bring a prejudiced view on pornographic material. The lawyer said, I'm looking for men and women who have no formed view on the subject of pornography. He was really looking for zombies on that subject who had not formed an opinion on it. And it took many, many days to find the members of the jury. But then they approached it this way. Notice how fascinating the approach was. When the man defending Flint was dealing with the witness counter to Flint's purpose, he looked at the witness and said this, Tell me, have you ever been into an art gallery? Yes. Have you ever been into an art gallery where there are paintings of the Grand Masters? Yes. Have you ever been into an art gallery with the paintings of the Grand Masters where you have had to pay to go in? Yes. Would you please tell this jury... Why you paid to go into an art gallery where there were paintings by the Grand Masters who had even painted disrobed and unclothed people, as one of the questions was, and they'd answered in the affirmative. Would you please tell this jury why you called that art and my client's productions pornography? How would you answer it? Because the average person with such limited opportunity to even deal with it hummed and hawed and struggled. Nobody came out with a possibly satisfactory answer. As I thought of it, there were two responses in my mind that I began to think about. One was when Michelangelo Payne started painting disrobed people. His teacher said to him, why are you doing this, Michael? 
He said, because I want to see man as God sees man. And his teacher said, but you are not God, are you? Very interesting that even at that stage, these issues were being debated. But even more to the point was this. C.S. Lewis in his book, A Pilgrim's Regress, imagines himself on this journey, allegorical journey in search for the answers to life and in search of God himself. He calls it a pilgrim's regress in distinction to progress because he recognizes that it was only after he found God that he had all the answers for why he had rejected everything contrary along the way. So he takes a regressive journey to answer those other alternatives. And in this allegorical form, he tells the moment as he, young John, was sitting in a mountain called the spirit of the age, he pictures himself enchained with no freedom at all. And the morning breakfast is served and he is unchained by the mountain called the spirit of the age whose countenance was grim and who was ruthless as he treated those whom he had enslaved within that mountain itself. So here is John unchained for the moment to enjoy his breakfast and the waiter representing the spirit of the age is watching as John reaches out for a glass of milk and drinks the milk and comments on how nourishing and how delicious it is, how refreshing it is to him. And the waiter mocks him with ridicule and says, Ah, you only call it milk nourishing and delicious. All it is is the secretion of a cow, like its urine or any other secretion. You call it nourishing and delicious. Lewis says, as a young man then in that setting, he said, I I just reacted with revulsion, but did not know how to respond to him. Then I went on and enjoyed the eggs that had been served for breakfast and commented on how nourishing and how delicious they were. You could imagine the comeback the waiter gave on that. It was absolutely uh, void of any sense of aesthetic or decency as he compared it to something rather crass and offensive. And he says, all you're doing is calling it eggs. It's tasty and delicious and nourishes to you. John says, I didn't know how to respond to these comparisons. But then he says this, moments later, reason came riding on a horse and reason rescued me. And as he rescued me, we rode away and reason turned around to the waiter and said, sir, you lie. You don't know the difference between what nature has meant for nourishment and what nature has meant for refuse or for garbage. You lie because you don't know the difference between what nature has meant for nourishment and what nature has meant for refuse or garbage. If there is a justification for the artist painting the unclothed person, maybe there might be in something like this. I don't know. That if there was a vulgarity, if there was a seductive desire, if there was a base and a a vile desire in the part of the artist putting that nude on the canvas, at least that vileness was confined to the artist and the ink and the canvas could not scream back. But as the disrobed woman sits in front of that lens, purely for the sake of stimulating the baser instincts in somebody somewhere to lead into an allurement of some form of seduction or wrongdoing, that woman ought to have stopped and covered that lens of the camera and say, sir, please don't do this to me. But the reason she wouldn't do it, here is the point, here is the point, this is the vital point, the reason she wouldn't do it is because when secularism has had its full run and its full course, it will produce a generation of men and women without shame, no sense of guilt for anything. That's what secularization can do when religious ideas, institutions, and interpretations have lost their social significance and man becomes the pure measure of all things. Shame as a real response is being removed. That's why psychological theorists today are addressing this whole issue of shame and guilt again, trying to put it in the context of the modern mindset which has jettisoned absolutes but is unable to expel the sense of shame and guilt within. That's the prime effect. And when you're dealing with issues of ethics in the medical profession, remember one of the things that the secularized consciousness has done is try to eradicate the sense of shame. And that's why when a doctor in California ultimately held the baby that was meant to have been born dead because of the abortive method he had instituted, when the baby was still breathing afterwards, when he held that child in the sink and literally choked it to death as Newsweek carried the story, 
and he walked away from there implying that it had actually died naturally even though the head nurse testified to the contrary and the pediatrician testified to the contrary he could walk away at least outwardly without any semblance of a troubled conscience if secularization has allowed its logical outworking it makes life unlivable because it eradicates that legitimate sense of shame that God has put into your heart and mind but not only is secularization the mood the second one is pluralization where there's a competing number of worldviews available to its members and no one worldview is dominant where there's a competing number of worldviews available to its members and no worldview is dominant now I could easily go into the philosophical aspect of how the law of non-contradiction works in society but I won't belabor that for you except to show you how the outworking of not believing in an absolute manifests itself Steve Turner the journalist in England incisively gives this tongue-in-cheek calling it the creed of the atheists we believe in Marx Freud and Darwin we believe everything is okay as long as you don't hurt anyone to the best of your definition of hurt and to the best of your definition of knowledge we believe in sex before during and after marriage we believe in the therapy of sin we believe that adultery is fun we believe that taboos are taboo we believe that everything is getting better despite evidence to the contrary the evidence must be investigated and you can prove anything with evidence we believe there's something in horoscopes UFOs and bent spoons Jesus was a good man just like Buddha Muhammad and ourselves he was a good moral teacher although we think some of his morals were basically bad we believe that all religions are basically the same at least the ones that we read were they all believe in love and goodness they only differ on matters of creation sin heaven hell God and salvation we believe that after death comes the nothing because when you ask the dead what happens they say nothing if death is not the end and if the dead have lied then it's compulsory heaven for all except perhaps Hitler Stalin and Chinggis Khan we believe in masters and Johnson what's selected is average what's average is normal what's normal is good we believe that each man must find the truth that is right for him and reality will adapt accordingly the universe will readjust history will alter we believe that there is no absolute truth except the truth that there is no absolute truth we believe in the rejection of creeds and the flowering of individual thought notice the postscript now if chance be the father of all flesh disaster is his rainbow in the sky and when you hear state of emergency sniper kills 10 troops on rampage whites go looting bomb blast school it is but the sound of man worshiping his maker the violence we see is the result of that creed I went on the Ohio State campus we had a tremendous response and by the way the students are always willing to give you a hearing whether it was Harvard or Princeton or Ohio State or anywhere the arenas have been packed beyond the rooms ability to contain the numbers every setting and in every setting after it's over the audience has risen to its feet in appreciation so what I say I say with this qualification because I'm not criticizing the opposition here or those who are giving us a hearing but I happen to be on that radio talk program which some of you have heard I know and on that program there was hostility some of them right from the beginning as Hugh Ross from California and I were on this open line together for one hour our host was an atheist and all of a sudden in the middle one woman phoned up rather irate very angry she said I know what your agenda is as men and as Christians I know what your agenda is and that she somehow brought out the whole issue of abortion I said madam did either of us even mention that issue that is not even the issue under debate she says I know but that's what's behind all of this talk anyway and she said I cannot I cannot accept the right of God in this and that and she really began to get irate and angry and wouldn't even let us talk I said all right can you just allow me to ask you one question just one question if you answer my question I let it go since you brought it up I said madam this is my question to you you have just spent the last few minutes defending your absolute right as a moral right to make the determination of what you have called your own body and that life within your body you have arrogated to yourself that absolute right and you call it your moral right to do as you will I said I've been on campuses where somebody has said something like this a plane crashed in such and such a place 50 people died 20 people lived 
What kind of a God are you worshipping? Who arbitrarily chooses 50 to die and 20 to live. He's not a very good God, is he? Not a very moral God. I said, can you explain this conundrum for me? When God is blamed for arbitrary choices that he allowed some to live and some to die, and you call him evil, when you give to yourself that right to determine the life of someone else, you call it a moral right. Can you explain this contradiction for me? Click. But that's what's happened. You see, pluralism is a good thing. But if pluralism gives way to moral relativism, then just as secularism eradicates shame, pluralization eradicates reason, which leaves you to the third mindset, privatization. Secularization, pluralization, privatization, where there's a cleavage between the public and the private, and you're compelled to find meaning in the private, where that which is most gratifying and fulfilling to you is not brought out in the public. And that then ends up with a loss of meaning. No shame, no reason, no meaning. The emotion and the outrage that comes out when you and I may respond from a Christian perspective, they are not content, some voices at least, to merely bring us to accept that view. It is demanded of us now that we celebrate that view with those of opposite perspectives. That is the first mindset that is somehow being superimposed within the framework of the Christian life. But there is a second one, and this is very, very subtle. And again, voices long before ours had alerted us to this, but we were not as receptive or certainly missed the urgency with which they were cautioning us. Listen to Chesterton because you'll identify with it best. You are free in our time to say that God does not exist. You are free to say that he exists and is evil. You are free to say like poor old Renan that God would like to exist if he could. You may talk of God as a mystification or metaphor. You may boil him down with gallons of long words or boil him down to the rags of metaphysics. And it is not merely that nobody punishes, but nobody protests. But if you speak of God as a thing like a tiger, as a reason for changing one's conduct, then the modern world will stop you somehow if it can. We are long past talking about whether an unbeliever should be punished for being irreverent. It is now thought irreverent to be a believer. These were in the last 30 to 50 years, alerting us to the path we have entered into. That's why I so commend an institution such as this, realizing what the entailments can be for moving into the 21st century. Our choices are only going to become more and more difficult, and the defense of your belief based on your belief in God is going to be harder to sustain. How did this happen? How did this come about? Let me present to you three mindsets that set the stage for where we are today and contrast them with what God has to offer in its place. Number one is the mindset of secularization, the mood of secularization. Let me define it as Oz Guinness, and who borrows from Peter Berger and gives this rather uh, good composite of what the process of secularization is all about. Secularization is a process as Guinness where religious ideas, institutions, and interpretations have lost their social significance. Let me repeat that. Where religious ideas, institutions, and interpretations have lost their social significance. In other words, even if you must claim to be a religious person in a secularized society, that is all right so long as you don't bring those ideas about in our social institutions and in public debate. Keep those ideas private. So secularization is where religious ideas, institutions, and interpretations have lost their social significance. If secularization has allowed its logical outworking, it makes life unlivable because it eradicates that legitimate sense of shame that God has put into your heart and mind. But not only is secularization the mood, the second one is pluralization where there's a competing number of worldviews available to its members and no one worldview is dominant, where there's a competing number of worldviews available to its members and no worldview is dominant. Now, I could easily go into the philosophical aspect of how the law of non-contradiction works in society, but I won't belabor that for you except to show you how the outworking of not believing in an absolute manifests itself. 
I went on the Ohio State campus. We had a tremendous response. And by the way, the students are always willing to give you a hearing, whether it was Harvard or Princeton or Ohio State or anywhere. The arenas have been packed beyond the room's ability to contain the numbers, every setting. And in every setting after it's over, the audience has risen to its feet in appreciation. So what I say, I say with this qualification because I'm not criticizing the opposition here or those who are giving us a hearing. But I happened to be on that radio talk program, which some of you have heard, I know. And on that program, there was hostility. Some of them right from the beginning, as Hugh Ross from California and I were on this open line together for one hour, our host was an atheist. And all of a sudden, in the middle, one woman phoned up rather irate, very angry. She said, I know what your agenda is as men and as Christians. I know what your agenda is. And the, she somehow brought out the whole issue of abortion. I said, Madam, did either of us even mention that issue? That is not even the issue under debate. She says, I know, but that's what's behind all of this talk anyway. And she said, I cannot, I cannot accept the right of God in this and that. And she really began to get irate and angry and wouldn't even let us talk. I said, all right, can you just allow me to ask you one question? Just one question. If you answer my question, I'll let it go. Since you brought it up, I said, madam, this is my question to you. You have just spent the last few minutes defending your absolute right as a moral right to make the determination of what you have called your own body and that life within your body. You have arrogated to yourself that absolute right and you call it your moral right to do as you will. I said, I've been on campuses where somebody has said something like this. A plane crashed in such and such a place. 50 people died, 20 people lived. What kind of a God are you worshipping who arbitrarily chooses 50 to die and 20 to live? He's not a very good God, is he? Not a very moral God. I said, can you explain this conundrum for me? When God is blamed for arbitrary choices that he allowed some to live and some to die and you call him evil, when you give to yourself that right to determine the life of someone else, you call it a moral right. Can you explain this contradiction for me? Click. But that's what's happened. You see, pluralism is a good thing. But if pluralism gives way to moral relativism, then just as secularism eradicates shame, pluralization eradicates reason, which leaves you to the third mindset, privatization. Secularization, pluralization, privatization, where there's a cleavage between the public and the private, and you're compelled to find meaning in the private, where that which is most gratifying and fulfilling to you is not brought out in the public. And that then ends up with a loss of meaning. No shame, no reason, no meaning. The counterpoint is very strong. And the counterpoints are these. Please follow me. You've got to give me your undivided attention here. We are often accused as Christians of bringing ideas, bringing doctrines, bringing dogmas. But you go back across the centuries and you see how this was handled by believers. In fact, I take you back to the biblical writers themselves. Listen, because this is profound here. The pursuit of the Hebrews was idealized and symbolized by light. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The people that sat in darkness have seen a great light. This is the light that lighteth every man that comes into the world. The pursuit of the Greeks was symbolized by knowledge. That's why the biblical writers say these things are written that you might know that you have eternal light. The Hebrew ideal was light. The Greek ideal was knowledge that you might know that you have eternal life. For the Hebrews, it was light. For the Greeks, it was knowledge. For the Romans, it was glory. For the Romans, it was glory. The, the glory of the city of Rome, the glory of the city that wasn't built in a day. And here we have it, the Apostle Paul, a Hebrew by birth, a citizen of Rome, living in a Greek city, had to give to them the ideal of his ethic. And he says this, God who caused the light to shine out of darkness has caused his light to shine in our hearts to give to us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus our Lord. For the Apostle Paul, the ultimate ethic was not an abstraction, not symbolized merely by light, not merely by knowledge, not merely by glory, 
but in the very face, the very face of our Lord. God who caused the light to shine out of darkness has caused his light to shine in our hearts to give to us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus our Lord. What does that mean to you and to me? Look at that face. Look at that face again and again in the scriptures. Look at that face particularly in the garden of Gethsemane as it's sweating away with drops of blood as it were. And let's look at that face as it is praying. He cries out, Holy Father, Holy Father, Holy Father. My dear Christian friend, one of the great pieces of news in the scriptures is that we are not orphaned in this world. We are not unattached in this world. That I am the creation of God himself, my holy father. And the first thing the Bible gives to me is not merely a dogma here or an ideal. It gives me a relationship and I come to him. And that father who watched his son on the cross and was very much with that son even in agony, is reminding you and me that he is our Holy Father as much as one of your patients who could be in anguish with a body racked with pain who can call upon that Holy Father. This is not an orphaned individual. Your patients can be given that Father. And not only that, when you stand alone where you are, your Heavenly Father watches your aloneness in that decision that wins the ridicule of everyone around you. The first thing God gives to us is not alienation. He gives us sonship. Sonship. I wish I had time to expand upon this because I know it would touch your heart and mine. But just to say this, it has become very, very special in my life. I've just written an article on violence and I raise the question, psychologists are telling us fatherless homes are having a bearing in producing violent children. If a home without a father is producing violent sons with untamed passions, what else can we expect in a world that has evicted the heavenly father? We too will become violent when that holy father has been taken off the cosmic scene. And what you're seeing in the death issue is the loss of the concept of that heavenly father. God gives to us sonship. Secondly, he gives to us worship. Worship binds. It is a submission of all of our nature to God, says William Temple. The quickening of conscience by his holiness, nourishment of mind by his truth, purifying of imagination by his beauty, opening of the heart to his love, and submission of will to his purpose. All this gathered up in adoration is the greatest expression of which we are capable. That's why Eric Little in the film Chariots of Fire can say, God's made me for a purpose for China, but he's also made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. Life is connected. Worship is coextensive with life. Isn't it comforting for you men and women to know that your life as a medical practitioner is an expression of your worship to God? You are serving him. You are serving him in worship where you are, protecting life, giving health, caring for the patient, walking to a stranger on the street whose body has been felled to put your mouth to his mouth to try and breathe life to him again, standing by a fragile body which is aching and hurting and cannot swallow anymore, holding little children in your arms while the agony of a parent is watching that life go away from that child. It is your worship. It is connected to what you do when you partake of the Lord's Supper. It is the sacredness of life. It binds everything you do. Sonship, worship, and finally, stewardship. He says to those first humans that they were to guard and to cherish. They were to love. They were to nourish. They were to nurture. They were to take care. And in Genesis 9, 6, When the first murder is described, we are told why murder is wrong. It is the violation of the image of God. That's what made it wrong. It was a violation of God's image, therefore a direct attack upon God himself. The reason we preserve life is because it reflects the image of God. God himself, the center of all moral reality, of holiness, of spiritual reality. Secularization leads to no shame. 
pluralization to no reason, privatization to no meaning, in an alienated, fragmented world. What we have to offer is sonship, connected to God our Father, worship, the cohesiveness of life itself, stewardship as caretakers of what God has given to us, particularly life itself. I walked into a home in Calcutta one day. The home is called Nirmal Hriday. Nirmal in Hindi means tender, Hriday means heart. It's the tender heart home. It sits exactly opposite the temple of Kali, the goddess of destruction. It's quite a popular spot, although so crowded with literally thousands within reach on the sidewalks of Calcutta. Calcutta is a city that almost defies description. I don't say that unkindly. Even when Rajiv Gandhi was prime minister, he almost said sometimes you wonder if it's a city that has any way to pull it back into saving the lives of the tens of thousands that are lost. For the homeless, it is just a sad sight on its streets. So you walk through the busy streets of Calcutta. If you've been there, you know whereof I'm speaking. And you enter into this home called Nirmal Hriday, run by Mother Teresa, the tender heart home. There's a sign as you enter the door to the ambulance drivers and anybody else. Please do not bring any destitute person in here unless they have also been rejected by the hospitals and everyone else. We do not have room for just the ordinary destitute. We can only admit those whom even the other shelters have turned down for the destitute of the destitute. I walked in there with my wife and a few friends. I saw a European woman so lovely in her youth cradling a man who may have been quite young himself but looked very old. His skin was tied taut around his fragile bony structure. Just a wrap around on his lower body and she was literally clutching him and had a little dropper and pulling at the end of his mouth with one finger and dropping some liquid nourishment and strength into the other I wish you could have seen his expression he just stared at her like a newborn babe would be fixed on the lovely face of its mother he just stared and stared and couldn't say a thing some of the drops were falling out, some he was swallowing. I looked at my wife and I said, you know, honey, that is probably the first time since his birth that somebody has ever put their arms around him. The Teresa method in Calcutta is called giving dignity to the dying. And that's exactly what they are doing. They are not giving death with dignity. They're giving dignity to the dying. You see, there's a difference when you come from sonship, worship, and stewardship. The whole word dignity is not our word. The word dignity is given to us, essentially given by God himself. We cannot confer it to a life that we have already described as a useless passion or merely a collocation of biographical information. No, the dignity is essential and we recognize it and give it with a tender heart. There's a woman with a heart, a woman with legitimate emotion, and that's why you and I are here, I trust, for the same. On that basis, I close with the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Or secularization, pluralization, privatization, may leave us with a society without shame and without reason and without meaning, but recognizing the sonship, the worship and stewardship rooted in the nature of God, we see it is the only hope for a valuable ethic. May I end with these words? Who stands his ground, says Bonhoeffer? The great masquerade of evil has wrought havoc with all our ethical preconceptions. This appearance of evil in the guise of light, beneficence and historical necessity, is utterly bewildering to anyone, anyone nurtured in our traditional ethical systems. But for the Christian who frames his life on the Bible, it simply confirms the radical evilness of evil. The failure of rationalism is evident. With the best of intentions, but with the naive lack of realism, the rationalist imagines that a small dose of reason will be enough to put the world right. In his short-sightedness, he wants to do justice to all sides, but in the melee of conflicting forces, he gets trampled upon without having achieved the slightest effect. Disappointed by the irrationality of the world, he realizes at last his futility, retires from the fray, and weakly surrenders to the winning side. 
Worse still is the total collapse of moral fanaticism. The fanatic imagines that his moral purity will prove a match for the power of evil. But like a bull, he goes for the red rag instead of the man who carries it and grows weary and succumbs. He becomes entangled with non-essentials and falls into the trap set by the superior ingenuity of his adversary. Then there is the man with a conscience. He fights single-handed against overwhelming odds in situations which demand a decision. But there are so many conflicts going on, all of which demand some vital choice with no advice or support save that of his own conscience, and he is then torn to pieces. Evil approaches him in so many specious and deceptive guises that his conscience becomes nervous and vacillating. In the end, he contents himself with a salve instead of a clear conscience and starts lying to his conscience as a means of avoiding despair. If a man relies exclusively on his conscience, he fails to see how a bad conscience is sometimes more wholesome and strong than a deluded one. When men are confronted by a bewildering variety of alternatives, the path of duty seems to offer a sure way out. They grasp at the imperative as one certainty. The responsibility for the imperative rests upon its author, not upon its executor. But when men are confined to the limits of duty, they never risk a daring deed on their own responsibility, which is the only way to score a bullseye against evil and defeat it. The man of duty will in the end be forced to give the devil his due. What about then of the man of freedom? He is the man who aspires to stand his ground in the world, who values the necessary deed more highly than a clear conscience or the duties of his calling, who is ready to sacrifice a barren principle for a fruitful compromise or a barren mediocrity for a fruitful radicalism. What then of him? He must beware lest his freedom should become his own undoing, for in choosing the lesser of two evils, he may fail to see that the greater evil he seeks to avoid may prove to be the lesser. Here we have the raw material of tragedy. Some seek refuge from the rough and tumble of public life in the sanctuary of their own private virtue. Such men, however, are compelled to seal their lips and shut their eyes to the injustice around them. Only at the cost of self-deception can they keep themselves pure from the defilements incurred by responsible action. For all that they achieve, that which they leave undone will still torment their peace of mind. They will either go to peace in the face of this disquiet or develop into the most hypocritical of all Pharisees. Who then can stand his ground? Only the person whose ultimate criterion is not merely his reason, his principles, his conscience, his duty, his freedom, or his virtue, but who is ready to sacrifice all these things when he is called to obedient and responsible action in faith and exclusive allegiance to God. The responsible person seeks to make his whole life a response to the question and call of God. That's what you have responded to. That's why the truth you stand for transcends mere rationality, conscience, duty, freedom, or virtue. It is based on God himself. Let us take that message of belongingness, of worship, and of stewardship, and use the mind God has given you in order to serve him in a radically difficult time.